Professor Walesho Inka is an award-winning dramaturgist, a Nobel laureate, a poet, a playwright, an activist, and of course, a professor, and much more besides. On part three of the trilogy, we will be touching on matters outside our borders. The professor will speak on his vision for Nigeria and may even remark on a diversionary matter of planes, biceps, and mistaken seats. I am Ekene Ezeji. Thank you again for enriching my time here with you. Um, I want to talk on issues concerning the xenophobic attacks. I know you're a passionate Pan-Africanist, and um, I wonder how you felt when you started hearing again about xenophobic attacks yet again in South Africa. What were your feelings? Uh, as you know, it's not new, and it's not against Nigeria alone, although Nigerians appear to have been um, Targeted? taking the brunt. Okay. There's some kind of collective uh, psychological warp, I think, in the makeup of today's South African. That warp has got to be addressed. We've got to speak very frankly about that. It's something which I have personally experienced, by the way. Okay. And if I have, on more than one occasion, you can imagine what the ordinary people have also experienced. I, my mind always goes back Sorry, to... Sorry, what did you experience? What was it like? I'm just curious. I was nearly sent back uh, from the airport. Yeah. In fact, it happened twice. Uh, yeah. And the hostility by this, even this young uh, immigration officers. In fact, as it happened on that flight, the um, Nigerian ambassador or high commissioner was, and he even intervened. And it had to do with the immigration, of, immigration officer, a young woman misreading the date on the passport and insisted we had to, I had to go with them to the, um, to, the, um, to the immigration office. And walking along the way, because she kept looking, I was watching her, she kept looking at it, you know. Yes. I saw the moment when she realized she'd made a mistake. And then she flipped over the passport and saw that it was Nigeria anyway, and continued her march. We went up to the office, um, <clears throat> there was also a friend of mine, a lawyer, who went with us. It was quite a scene. Went to the office. I pointed out what I felt was the error, and fortunately some other senior immigration officers recognized uh, me and came and saw what it was. And they said, no, 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 this is okay. This girl, her attitude, just because of that passport, it was so hard, it was unbelievable. In fact, I reached the point, as we were leaving, I said to her, you see, I said, I noticed when you saw that, uh, that you'd made a mistake. I said, why did you bring us? You needed to see how she fled up. And I said, I'm going to report you. He said, yes, this is mine. Yeah, take a look, take a look. I was looking at the, um, so I was, you know, pacified by the senior people and the ambassador who were around to sleep. This happened to me there. It's not the first time. There was another time I was kept there. Uh, I was coming from the States at that time, and there was, uh, I didn't have a, uh, a visa. I was, an emergency thing, I was invited for a lecture. In fact, it was in connection with Mandela's celebration. And I was assured there would be a visa waiting for me at the airport. I don't go anywhere, I'm not invited. <laughs> I was assured there'd be a visa there. Anyway, cut a long story short. It took Gasha Machel. I was already on my way out. It took Gasha Machel to intervene. I said, do you know what you're doing? <laughs> you know who this is? And she raised hell with them. I spent about close to nine hours wow. at the airport. I just said, I am leaving here. And after that episode, I did not go to South Africa. I turned down invitations over nine invitations in two years, I said, I'm not I'm never stepping into this, your country again. I went, give the lectures. I said, I'll do anything for Mandela, his memory, and so on. For me, 
he's my avatar. I said, oh, dude, but at the end of the lectures, I took my luggage to the lectures. Straight from the lectures, I went to the airport and left. I said, I'm dusting the feet of this country. But isn't it okay. strange that a man with such a legacy could have people who don't seem to bear the hallmarks of what it's good for? You know, as I'm speaking to you here, I am owed money by some South African firms. And <laughs> I went to give a lecture once. They owe me, till today, $15,000. In fact, I wanted to ask Buhari, who, I want to send him a note, say, could you please collect my $15,000 <laughs> for me from these VUCA people they are called? You see, because I'm a Nigerian, they want to cheat me out of $15,000. You know, they are strained to deliver that lecture. It's now over two years ago. They think they've got away with it, but they've got another thing coming. I'm a very patient person. You're still I just hope that money is accumulating interest there. And I said to myself, why are they treating me like this? But I've spoken to other South Africans, including some young people who do straightforward business, you know, contributing to that society. And the treatment they receive, there's something very serious. That's why I use the word warp. There's something that's happened, I think, maybe as a result of the apartheid experience is suspicion that other people are coming to treat them like, you know, the Second birds class. Okay. treated them, a kind of victim complex, maybe also aspects of Franz Fanon's theory about how uh, victims tend to victimize other victims okay. even much more than their own oppressors. It's something which, let's speak frankly, South Africans have to deal with. One is not denying that Nigerians themselves can be a handful outside. Mm. We know that. But then there are other nations also who are more than a handful in other societies. It's very easy to target collectivities. We know we are not innocent here totally of uh, xenophobia, of victim, of victimizing immigrants among us. How do you expression Ghana must go come back. We've also expelled people. So in a sense, there's some kind of poetic justice about it. But now I think it's about time we transcended all these negative histories and mm -hmm. just treat one another. Even forget whether we assisted you in uh, apartheid or not. Nobody owes anybody anything. If I move to help any people liberate themselves, I'm also liberating myself. Because as long as you know, people exist who are under the oppressor's boot. If we are human beings, we are also equally you know, uh, oppressed. So it's not a question of gratitude. It's a question of just treating other people like human beings. Mm. Um, so what do you think of the president's um, approach or stance? You know, he's there and he's acknowledging that we mm -hmm. ought to behave like good, um, do you say, visitors when we're in other people's countries. The, the first thing I want to say is that I'm very glad that we did not retaliate at least in that crude way. Yes. I know there are one or two uh, instances which happened, but basically, collectively, we did not retaliate. That's very important. You know. Now, um, I'm going to leave presidents to use whatever language they require among themselves. All we want is action. We want to see people uh, make restoration for past violation. It's no different for me from what we preach, what we insist upon here. I don't want to hear when, and I said it at a time, I want to hear when people have been slaughtered, you know, you, you just mindlessly. I don't want to hear a president then going there and saying, you must all learn to live together like neighbors. That's not enough. We've got to see you take action. Punitive, restorative action. That those who have violated others, they must be made to make restoration one way or the other. Only then can you close the circuit of, this, of violence. Uh, pious statements are not enough because pious statements do not address the grievances of those who've been violated. So whether we're talking about Benue, or we're talking about Kaduna, or we're talking about Zamfara, or we're talking about Johannesburg, the same measure of humane interaction has got to be applied. Power statements are not enough. Mm -hmm.
As we draw to a close, I just wanted to, because you talked about an airport saga, one came to mind, a more recent controversial one concerning Toye Ko, where he talked of a baseball bicep youth who insisted that you move over from his seat. What's your take on this, this young man? Uh, let me say one thing, by the way. I was not part of that event. Again, when we talk about Fake the <laughs> social media, they, it's, they make me sick. Oh dear. This thing didn't even involve me. I sat in the wrong seat. My ticket was D. There were four seats, A, B, C. So I assumed D was the four, was, uh, the four seat. I sat there. And this um, young man came and said, oh, this is my seat. I said, no, 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 no. So I brought out the stop on my ticket, called the, um, oh, I didn't mean call, the air host, uh, hostess, steward. I was looking at she assisted me. She said, ah, no problem. I began packing my papers to go next. So it was the others. This thing was entirely <laughs> between the people on the seat and this young man. And they said, what's the matter? Take the seat next to him, you know. And then they gave me the impression that everything, because everything went quiet. Mm. But in actual fact, the young man was waiting for the crowd, uh, the, because people were still coming okay. in. And so I realized that. And so when they finished, I invited him uh, to come and take his seat. His seat. Mm. And then something went on between the two. I, I was reading my papers. <laughs> so it, I wasn't even part of this whole thing. But what matters is that when the, um, the new uh, passengers had finished, I think it was possible then to comfortably change seats, and that's what happened. And, and for me, that was that's the, the end, end of, of the matter. matter. But then, no, do, you, no. do, you, do you sympathize with some who have said that it's a testament to at least a certain kind of youth that we're looking for, who is much less reverential by default and a bit more ready to assert their own rights? You know, is it positive? Is it well, a positive? Well, if, if they're talking about that, the, the man had the right to ask for his seat mm -hmm. back, and for me, it was not an issue. Yes. It was not an issue, but of course, social media, especially when people have their own agenda, mm. it was the opportunity. Now, let me amuse you. Let me entertain I'm already entertained. And, uh, about, <laughs> about something. Yes. I was in Abuja, and I was flying. This took place between Lagos and Abuja. And the reason I was in Abuja, I was to fly out the following day. The following day in the plane, when I got to my seat, people had occupied my seat. Okay. So the shoe was on the other foot. Yeah, the shoe was on the other okay. foot. I said, ah, madam, this is my seat. She looked, she found she was wrong. We changed seats. Fine. No drama. More. That same trip, it was a very remarkable trip. <laughs> Between London and Nigeria, I got there. A whole row of them. If I had the card of one of the women who was sitting in that place. And behind them, I was, at this time I was in an economy uh, seat. And uh, so I said, no problem, I'll take the seat next to, uh, behind you. It turned out it was not just one seat, the entire row. Apparently after the first person came, the next person joined. So you had a whole row of people sitting in the wrong seat. place. Everything went on smoothly, we stayed, which I can't even remember how we started moving around. And so. so this was not an issue. Mm -hmm. People are insane on, I've used the expression saying Vitos dance, you know, which that infectious dance which took place, uh, overtook people in the medieval Europe. And everybody began to dance. They didn't know why they were dancing. They danced from morning till night, night till daybreak. They started the following morning. And apparently it's an epidemic which happens from time to time okay. in certain parts of the world. Nigerians are constantly in the grip of St. Vitos dance in which some trivia, some trivia thing becomes a big an deal. issue. Yeah. It shows that there's something fundamentally wrong somewhere and what I think people sometimes call transferred aggression. Oh. So they take out that aggression on the media and I just happened to have been the caught in the crossfire. <laughs> but it, it just was ridiculous. <laughs> some of the links which are sent to me, yes. it was like, well, you were like that in your youth. I said, what is my business? What has that to do? I'm like what? To, yes, <laughs> yes. You know, <laughs> I, I even got from 
One even sent me um, a quotation from uh, my biography when I said I was not going to prostrate to, you know, I didn't like prostrating. Why yes. should I prostrate to human beings when I don't prostrate to God? Mm. What that had to do with a mistaken seat on the thing, very punctual, very sanctimonious. Uh, <laughs> they already assumed they knew where you were I didn't coming from. I didn't reply. <laughs> okay. That's what you get. On social from, media. From, from, from Very yeah. quickly, because I know where, where I really, I, I, I should really be closing now, but I'm, I'm enjoying engaging with you so much. I want you to just say something about female participation in politics. Obviously, as a woman, we were a bit disappointed with the way we seem to be taking two steps back in terms of the appointment of ministers, despite the president's wife making an appeal for greater numbers. You know, do you feel this is why Nigeria is not showing any spark of inspiration? The fact that women are not being seen to be active in the mm. political space the way they ought to be? Well, I was very disappointed also with the, um, with the, uh, the lack of um, impressive show of women as candidates. The previous election, for instance, I, I can tell you this, I had hoped for a, a, a high level of emergence from the COA party, which, okay. is, yes. which was headed by a, a woman. And in fact, I think we spoke, I asked her, I said, why aren't you um, um, in this time? What, what's happened? But her party was still there. But she told me that the party decided to field this young man. I said, okay, uh, that's fine. Either she did or one of uh, my people anyway. And it could be also, yes, that we are cutting our noses to spite our face. This attitude of um, sidelining women. If, for instance, a woman with good credentials, no negative baggage, capable of showing intelligent vision, as did the leader of COA, Remember, she had publications, mm -hmm. just like Mogalu also had publications in the previous election. I think Nigerians should very seriously consider that maybe one of the reasons we're just stagnating, even uh, retrogressing, is because we've neglected, we keep neglecting in zones of power and influence, and effective administration, the female gender. I'm very glad you raised that issue. Yes. Um, just to quickly seem to offer an alternative um, narrative concerning the Mieti Allah, because when you mentioned it, I made a mental note. Mm. I had spoken to a Mieti Allah herdsman who is based in Enugu, speaks Igbo to some extent. And the case he made was concerning Roga anyway, was not that Roga, that Roga shouldn't be seen as something that is... Um, aggressive or something to be resisted because all it was doing was affirming a state that was already in existence, seeing as a lot of them already lived in these parts of Nigeria for years, spoke the language interrelated inter with the people there. Um, all it was doing was creating a confine, so to speak, so that people were able to respect their different... So I just want to tender that because you, you presented a profile of uh, an insensitive Mieti Allah Herdsman, and I just wanted to say, well, there are some who say they live amongst us and just want to be affirmed that they live amongst us. They don't necessarily like the way the government went about bringing it into the public space, but they feel that it's nonetheless a valid issue to pursue. Mm -hmm. Does that change anything? Yeah, um, in every organization, you have rotten eggs, you have bad eggs, and uh, of course you have some sound eggs, you know, you have even have good solid eggheads, those, that is those who can intellectualize, you know, and situate uh, situations both in, uh, situate uh, events, you know, conflicts, both in history and in contemporary terms. Those who are capable of looking at examples outside uh, the nation and to suggest objectively these are possibilities. One thing which we must never do uh, or at least we do at our own peril, is to try and reward force, reward violence. 
In other words, even if policies, long-term policies, are going to emerge from a situation of conflict or violence, we've got to operate and present those policies in a way in which it does not appear that it is as a result of that violence, that violation of other people's rights that we have now granted the possibilities of, uh, of the requests so you're not in favor of the violators. Of, you're not in favor of amnesties. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. It's, this is where leadership, intelligent leadership, comes from. Basically, there's nothing wrong with uh, government-assisted commercial ranches all over the country. Nobody would ever uh, object to that. But we must stop this habit of saying, of doing things uh, uh, in a way which suggests that a particular uh, business is the prerogative of just one ethnic group. If you're going to have, for instance, VUCA assisted, I mean, government assisted ranches, the VUCA, make it open to everybody. I don't accept any notion that any business, any occupation, is you know, prenaturally, prenatally tied to any one group. I, I was very glad to read uh, Melai saying that he also wants his yes. to be settled with the settlement. Yes, I read that. Yeah, why yeah. not? There's no reason why I can't decide that I want to go into the ranching business. Yeah. If VUCA is organized, is presented as an objective alternative, generally, not something conceded to any particular group, especially a group which has spoken out in such arrogant and authoritative and really peremp you know, peremptory terms, dictating to governments, warning about consequences if certain laws passed constitutionally by a government are not rescinded, who say they have a right to ensure that their own business takes priority over other businesses like farming and thereby affecting even those of us who are not in those areas. In other words, a situation like that should not be treated in a very in a simplistic manner of, okay, we found a solution, all is well. No, you don't do things like that. This is where, for me, this leadership failed in its presentation of an alternative to the nation. Thank you for that. Well, in closing, I mean, doubtless, despite all the myriad of pr problems we've touched on, and we haven't touched on all of them, mm -hmm. um, you still have hope in Nigeria, I'm assuming. And so I just want you to speak of the Nigeria of your dreams, if you were to uh, frame that for us. You know, where, where do you see us getting to in, in, in your dreams? Mm -hmm. Help us with that, please. Uh, dream. <laughs> I hope you're still dreaming. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good question because... Um, you know, it's almost, as you said something, I had a sense of deja vu, just as a flash. I'd even forgotten. In this very sitting room here, the only of Ife visited. We sat, we had dinner at that table just over there. And he was sort of agitated by, you know, this um, clash, you know, these herdsmen. Yes. And we'd spoken before and... He said he was coming just to have a brainstorming session. And of course, from that, we moved. What is Nigeria? What do we envisage about Nigeria? What do we see in Nigeria? What, what should come out of even conflicts like this? What, what should be the ultimate destination? And I think one thing which became clear was in Nigeria, uh, which doesn't deceive itself, which doesn't forget its history, and therefore learns. In Nigeria, which is ready to make mistakes, but got to admit even the mistakes of its own coming in being, the anomalies in its coming in being. In Nigeria, which is capable of thinking for herself, and which recognizes the fact that if there's something artificial about our coming and being, we must begin by addressing such artificial beginnings. It doesn't mean that they're not viable. 
you understand me? We must not pretend. I dream of a Nigeria which no longer pretends about its own nature, its own characteristic, as I said, its own constitutional uh, mode of coming in being. A Nigerian of complete equality, egalitarian apportionment, and the opening up of possibilities of individual fulfillment. It's not a Nigeria I can encapsulate in a few words. That's one of the reasons why I generally avoid that question. But I will I try to answer it you today partially. Uh, I'm, I'm dreaming, in fact, of a Nigeria which is impossible to achieve. That's not a pessimistic statement. It's an ambition. I'll think about that, <laughs> how an impossibility can be an ambition. Interesting. It's been a pleasure engaging with you. I feel like I could set up camp in your home and just come up with questions back to back, but we have to call it a wrap on this Thank special you. edition. Thank you so much for hosting us. It's You're a lovely welcome. place here. I know you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. I trust you've been left with more than a few nuggets of insight. The vision of an impossible but ambitious dream of Nigeria. Hmm, that takes some digesting. You've been watching a special edition of One on One with Nobel laureate Professor Wale Shoinka, exclusive to Plus TV Africa. I am Ekene Ezeji.